were soldiers of the Queen. That was Queen Victoria. And she was a good queen, though, the old Queen Victoria. And they were going away to, uh, they were going down to the pier, like the Broome Law in Glasgow, to embark for South Africa. I mind of that, eh? <laughs> October 1899, Britain went off to war to beat the Boers and secure South Africa for the Empire. There were polo sticks and crates of champagne in the hold. They thought it would be over by Christmas. Soldiers of the Queen. No, I don't think they were hollow words at all. We revered the royalty in those days, uh, which is sadly absent at the present time. And I think a number of them thought that they were really fighting for the Queen and the Empire. <laughs> The Boer War took the world into the 20th century and taught Britain a resounding lesson. The greatest empire ever needed nearly three years to beat a Boer army smaller than the population of Brighton. It became the first modern conflict, a guerrilla war of scorched earth, concentration camps. Blacks were both victims and protagonists and were condemned by the war to nearly a hundred years of oppression. It has cast a long shadow across the century. The Boer War was dominated by the land over which it was fought, a war which began with a simple, seemingly innocent aim. It's about freedom, nothing else. It's not about hating anyone. You just want your place in the sun. You want your rights. That's all it's about. Kent gij dat volk vol helden En toch zo lang in 1836, hundreds of farmers, or Boers, trekked from the British Cape Colony deep into South Africa. Of mostly Dutch descent, devout and determined, they sought new lands to settle and farm, as far from British rule as possible. Boer trekkers climbed a hill in Natal they called Spion Kop, Lookout Hill. They gazed across fertile country, believing they had an absolute right to it, as do their descendants. Do was here nie. There were no black tribes then. The black tribes, Zulus and others, moved down from the north. It's in the history books. There were no tribes. Any land we got in Natal was lawfully bought from the Zulu people. We never annexed any land. People got land or farms which were empty. On the 16th of December, 1838, 12,000 Zulus attacked 470 Boers at Blood River. 
The Boers formed their wagons into a defensive ring, commemorated in this bronze replica. The Boers had guns and cannon. The Zulus had spears and shields. That day, the Boers killed 3,000 Zulus. I think that the idea of the Boers as a people was born at the Battle of Blood River. We say that God was with us at the Battle of Blood River. We prayed and said, you must help us because we will then dedicate this victory to you. The Boer victory at Blood River became the foundation stone of their belief not only in God, but in themselves as the natural rulers of the land. In the 1850s, the Boers founded their own republics, the Transvaal and Orange Free State. But this brought conflict with Britain. South Africa was of key strategic importance on the sea route to India, a vital piece in the imperial jigsaw. If you were to take any school maps at that time, you'd find the predominant colour there was red, a pinkish red, really, and that covered places like India, Canada, Australia, and we were extending our powers all the time, but we were, what should I say, it was a kind of beneficent theft. The Transvaal had briefly been a British colony, but broke free after the Boers won a short war against Britain in 1881. So this was unfinished business. Driving British ambitions in Africa was Cecil Rhodes. As Prime Minister of the Cape Colony, he had grand schemes for a modern empire. He planned to build a railway from the Cape to Cairo and to control the lands and their wealth between. The Transvaal and Orange Free State were of little interest as long as they just produced sheep and corn. But the discovery of gold changed everything. The Transvaal became the richest and potentially most powerful state in southern Africa. Britain now saw it as a political threat and an economic resource ripe for exploitation. Gold. 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 They found gold in our country. That's what they were after, the gluttons. The president of the Transvaal was Paul Kruger, veteran of the Great Trek. He believed God had put blacks on earth to serve the Boers. Blacks did not need political rights. But what about the 100,000 white English and Europeans drawn by gold to the Transvaal? Their labours had turned Johannesburg into a rich cosmopolitan city. They paid their taxes, but had no vote. My father said they should let them vote. They can't let them pay all the rates and taxes and not vote. But old Paul Kruger was afraid they'd vote him out of office. So he didn't give them the vote. Johannesburg, as it now is, was built by us. Yet you pass iniquitous laws denying us the ordinary rights of citizenship. Mr. President, we are here now seeking redress by constitutional methods. But if you persist in your attitude of blank refusal, you try us beyond endurance. Johannes Paul Kruger is my name. Johannesburg is my own town. And I feel towards it like a father whose daughter has been debauched by ropes and thieves. The interview is at an end. Cecil Rhodes, as usual, had a plan. Nothing less than to take the Transvaal by force. By the end of December 1895, 
he had 600 men, led by his swashbuckling sidekick, Dr. Leander Starr Jameson. And in London, he had the ever-so-secret blessing of the British colonial secretary himself, Joseph Chamberlain. But Kruger knew about the Jameson raid in advance and waited till it had set off before striking. The message over the wires, Mr. President. Jameson has started. He's marching towards the border. I have my white horse brought to the door. You'll find it ready saddled. Paul, is a danger. I'll be back in a few days. Fetch my boots. If you want to kill a tortoise, Kruger said, you must wait until it puts its head out. Jameson was ambushed and never reached Johannesburg. He lost 65 men and was led off weeping to prison. It became an international scandal. London pretended the Jameson raid was a rogue operation, but the Boers were not fooled. They used their gold to purchase an arsenal of the latest weapons from Europe. Krupp field guns and Mauser rifles from Germany. Crusoe siege guns from France. In June 1899, peace talks failed. Kruger felt increasingly threatened, but refused to compromise his country's independence. And Britain's negotiator with Kruger wouldn't have accepted a compromise anyway. Sir Alfred Milner wanted the Transvaal wrested away from stubborn conservative Boers like Kruger and placed firmly within the modern British Empire. With British troops at his border, Kruger decided to strike first. President Kruger knew how powerful the English were. He said, you do not want voting rights, you want my country. That is what the war was all about. They wanted our land. On the 11th of October, 1899, the Boers declared war on Great Britain and promptly besieged the towns of Mafeking, Kimberley, and Ladysmith in the British Natal and Cape colonies. Then it became real war. It had just been trouble brewing before that. And when the real war came, the Boers shut up or they surrounded those towns and wanted to starve them out. Well, not being as highly civilized as we were, in their more rough way, when they got angry, they got a bit cruel. Using their new siege guns, the Boers shelled the towns, hitting hospitals, killing women and children. If British people are in trouble, the country's got to help them out. And if the British start a war, they've got to win. Why dolly, I must be At 47,000 men, the British force wasn't huge, but they weren't expecting a huge war. Among the journalists was 24-year-old Winston Churchill. He was said to be both clever and bumptious. In command was General Sir Redvers Buller, VC, veteran of the Zulu War. I hear the bugle calling. Goodbye, he was filmed boarding ship in a tall hat shaking hands. He said he hoped he wouldn't be away long. Goodbye, Dolly Clay. At last we have arrived. We sighted land at 8 a.m. 
the harbour was crowded with great transports, crowded with soldiers. There were 5,000 while we were there, and I don't know how many horses. And the wharves and sheds are piled with boxes of ammunition, biscuits, stores and hay. In fact, you have no idea of Britain's greatness till you see a place like this. We had five miles to walk through Cape Town, and it fairly took the starch out of some of us. From their open trucks, the ordinary soldiers, or Tommies, looked out at the strange land unfolding and wrote home about it. Corporal Harold Armstrong of the Kensingtons began to sense how hostile the environment was and how it favoured the Boers. We're plagued by beetles, flies and fleas. Frightful country for marching. The hills bristle with mounds of stone which would afford splendid shelter for marksmen. But at first, many officers treated the war as a hunting party. The Boers would be caught like pheasants in drives. Camouflage was unsporting. It would be a pushover, like wars they'd won against primitive tribesmen. They didn't think that it was going to last very long. They knew that the Boers were virtually farmers without any military training or anything like that, and that there wouldn't be very much opposition. And as a result, when the army arrived in South Africa, according to what my father told me, there was very little reconnaissance. Very often, I remember him saying that Several officers would get together and they'd say, see that copy over there? Let's go and see if there's any boards up there. I tell you what, I'll race you there. And they'd charge off on their horses. And if the boards happened to be there, well, then, of course, they got casualties. And then they realised that uh, there's more to the boards than they'd thought. Burgers op naar die oorlogsveld, so weer klink die woord. To sien jy net commando strek na oos, wees, suid en noord. The Boer Republics mobilised over 30,000 men. They formed into commandos from each district. Sons joined with fathers. Whole families heeded the call to arms. Each man supplied his own horse and rifle. The idea was to defeat the garrison The idea was to defeat the British garrisons on the borders. Many set out full of courage, with slogans on their hats, Cape Town or Bust, or cries like, we'll soon be eating bananas in Durban, the war will be over by Christmas. There was a feeling that a few quick victories and Britain will be willing to give us back our independence. It was an army quite unlike the British. The Boers were bound by common cause, but not by discipline. The men elected their officers and didn't have to obey them. The Boer is a strong individualist. Early in the war, an officer would often say, take that hill. He'd be talking to a commando of 150 men. Then 50 men would go and take the hill. The other 100 would go home, put their feet up, make coffee, cook a meal, saying, we'll catch up with you later. It was quite clear in the beginning of the war. I will make war, but on my terms. The Boers declared it a white man's war and promptly took their black servants with them. Perhaps 12,000 in all. Some went willingly. Others, like Paulie McQuenna's father, weren't given an option. Basquas Ras was not a man who liked a black person telling him what to do. 
He wanted to be the one to tell the black man what to do. If he told you to go with him, you couldn't say no. My father took his boss's horse when it was tired and rested it. He had to remove the saddles and polish and prepare them. Where the boss went, he went. He had to carry his gun for him and follow him to the front where the fighting was. That's how Mr. Kuzratz went to war. The British agreed it was a white man's war and then employed tens of thousands of blacks as ox drivers, laborers, scouts and spies. My father joined the British forces because he could be paid. He didn't have that political affiliations one way or the other. The Boers didn't have the money to pay them. And uh, the English had the money to pay them. And there were also uh, supplies of uh, food and all the rest of it. They were treated like soldiers, even though they were not soldiers. Six thousand miles from the war, eight-year-old Arthur Whitlock kept up with the British Army's progress across South Africa. I was able to follow the war more closely because the Daily Mail, they brought out a map and you had little flags with pins on them and you pin them showing the position of the various troops. Arthur followed the movement of Lord Methuen with 8,000 men to relieve Kimberley and Mafeking, encircled by the Boers. General Buller, with 15,000, was off to relieve Ladysmith. But in their way stood the Boers, helped by the volunteer Irish Brigade. They leapt at the chance to strike a blow for the rights of small nations against the British oppressor. What they learned detonating railway lines in South Africa would later be put to use with the IRA. As well as blowing up bridges, the Boers ambushed trains, and armoured trains in particular. On the 15th of November, 1899, Winston Churchill took a ride in one. The Guardian correspondent refused to go saying Churchill would either see too little or too much. The Boers derailed the train here, at the foot of this hill. My grandfather was the medical officer on the armoured train. During this derailment, they came under fire from the ridge west of the railway line, uh, and the fire was pretty heavy, and they were wounded almost from the first. And Winston Churchill was on that armoured train. I can remember my grandfather saying that uh, he remembered Winston Churchill turning to his batman and saying, pass me my heavy revolver. <laughs> Churchill switched abruptly from journalist to leader of men. An intense fight followed, resulting in four dead, 14 wounded and 58 taken prisoner including Winston Churchill. And then, on his way to prison in Pretoria, Churchill was treated to a lecture by his Boer guard, which suddenly made him see why the Boers opposed them so bitterly. They feared that the British in victory would give full equal rights to the blacks. Fancy letting the black folk walk on the pavement. Educate a Kaffir. Ah, that's you English all over. We educate them with a stick. They were put here by the God Almighty to work for us. Insist on their proper treatment, will you? We'll settle whether you English are to interfere with us before this war is over. 10th of December, 1899. British artillery pounded poor positions in the hills around the besieged towns. 
hills like Margusfontein near Kimberley. After the heavy bombardment, it showed no signs of Boer life. So three and a half thousand men of the Highland Brigade prepared to capture it. It was a night attack in a thunderstorm. There had been no reconnaissance. Near the foot of the hill, they were hit by a tremendous volley of bullets. Some were killed, others panicked and ran. Most stuck it out. For the whole of the next day, the Highlanders lay on the plain without shelter from long-range Mausers or baking sun. But where were the Boers shooting from? To answer that question, Lord Methuen ordered an aerial reconnoiter. While the battle raged below, Captain Jones went up to look for the enemy. Filled balloon Titania made a sense for observing purposes for several hours. Saw Kimberley in the distance. But the Boer position was so well taken up that it was almost impossible to locate. But Captain Jones was looking in the wrong place. The Boers weren't on the hill at all. They were secure in a trench at its foot. The trench is still there. A century ago, Michael Heffer's father, Louis, lay behind it, picking off the Highland Brigade. After a day of slaughter, a truce was called. Michael remembers his father's words. I got up and walked over to where the Scottish troops were lying. Some had up to seven bullet holes through the head. I was very moved to see these young men. The reason was because there wasn't one old man there. They were all kids. My father saw an old Scottish minister walking amongst them, reading from a Bible. My father said it touched him deeply to see all the dead people, even though it was a big Boer victory. There were over 900 British casualties. The Black Watch and Seaforths bore the brunt. One Highlander said they had been taken into a butcher's shop and left there. A private in the Black Watch dictated a poem from his hospital bed. Why weren't we told of the trenches? Why weren't we told of the wire? Why attack in the quarter column? May Tommy Atkins inquire. Why were no scouts sent forward? Why were no scouts on our flank? Why were we marched up in column? Who made the mistake? Give his rank. Do they know his name in old England? Do they know his incompetence yet? Tommy has learned to his sorrow, and Tommy will never forget. They called it Black Week in Britain. There had been two other defeats in five days, at Stormberg and Colenso. I realise by the actual news in the paper that uh, things weren't going too well. It was probably due to the lack of supplies and our fighting in an unknown country where those on the spot were very familiar with it. It was humiliating. No one alive in 1899 could remember a time when the British had been beaten so resoundingly. A century of certainty overturned by a bunch of foreign farmers. Lord Wolseley, Commander-in-Chief of the British Army, was appalled. We are face to face with a serious national crisis, and unless we meet it boldly, it will lead to dangerous complications with foreign powers. <laughs> But the foreigner's first instinct was to laugh. <laughs> Queen
Queen Victoria had her own reply. We are not interested in the possibilities of defeat. But Boer response to trouncing Britain was strangely subdued. Foreign volunteers fighting with the Boers were astounded that the Boers were not elated about these victories. But it was just part of God's plan. We are good shots with the help of God. This slogan, with the help of God, almost became a philosophy of life. So they accepted the victories and all was well. We have no problems. Christmas is coming and we might have peace in the near future. But there was no chance of peace. An atmosphere of defiant jingoism now ruled in Britain. While Queen Victoria cheered up the soldiers already in South Africa with a tin of chocolates each for Christmas, Lord Wolseley decided to double the army. The Imperial Volunteers were formed, with gentlemen for the first time serving in the ranks. People now spoke of it as a national war. And after the failures of Buller and Methuen, new leaders were called for. Enter Field Marshal Lord Roberts of Kandahar and Lord Kitchener of Khartoum himself. I remember they used to sing a song. Lord Roberts and Kitchener, General Buller and White, four of the bravest generals that ever went out to fight. And then it went on. And when the war is over, how happy we'll be, for I love Rosie O'Grady, and Rosie O'Grady loves me. On the 10th of January 1900, Roberts landed in Cape Town as Commander-in-Chief over General Buller. In contrast with the patriotic optimism back home, Roberts had deep misgivings about the campaign. His only son, Freddie, had just been killed during Buller's failed bid to relieve Ladysmith. Buller was now just 16 miles from Ladysmith. Wary of chalking up another defeat, he put General Warren in temporary command. In between Warren and Ladysmith was a formidable range of hills. British mounted infantry scouting on the left flank stumbled on a clear route round the hills to Ladysmith. This would have averted the bloodiest battle of the whole war. But the British Army of 1900 was no place for initiative. Warren ordered these men back and decided to force straight through the hills. That meant capturing Spion Kop, the same vantage point from which the Voortrekkers had looked out 60 years before. One of the officers taking part in the operation was Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Thornycroft. It was to be a surprise attack at night up this valley to Spion Cop beyond. But Thornycroft realised they would get hopelessly lost in the darkness. So he sat here at dusk and, noting the landmarks ahead, drew a sketch map to guide them. A century on, Thornycroft's family brings a copy of the map back to Spion Cop. Ah, that's mm -hmm. the expert. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's, it's wonderful. They show it to their guide, Gilbert so Torlagi. There was uh, a sandstone shelf down the side here, which mm. is visible. Isn't it? Yeah, it's done The map enabled the assault force of 1,700 men to make their way up Spion Cop. Pitch dark night, but how many boys are here? Have they got artillery with them? No one knows. Orders were that they were to be absolutely silent. No talking, no smoking, no lights, no firing. And slowly, 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 they made their way up that spur. Private Matthew Kelly recalled the lengths they went to to ensure silence. 
All the dogs which are following us are destroyed. After marching for two or three hours, we are told quietly that we have passed the enemy sentries and are in their lines. Spionkop itself was in fact only lightly guarded by the Boers. But they had reinforcements, including artillery, close at hand. And the British, having failed to reconnoitre Spionkop, didn't know that just beyond it lay a semicircle of hills, perfect positions for the Boers to bombard Spionkop itself. A little after three in the morning, the British reached the grassy plateau which rises gradually to form the summit. Probably when they were somewhere in this area, yeah. suddenly out of the darkness came a tremendous challenge of beast R. Getting no response, the boys opened fire, the British charge forward, and they catch one of those boys, bayonet him and kill him. The rest of the boys ran away, and with that the British then gave three hurrahs to indicate to everybody that Spionkop had fallen into British hands. The British now dug themselves in. This row of stones marks the line of the trench. But the ground was rocky, and many picks and shovels had been abandoned on the long walk up. The trench was barely 18 inches deep. Enveloped in fog, the exhausted soldiers now snatched some rest. It wasn't until dawn that they realized just how dangerously close the Boer front line was. About 7 a.m. the sun breaks through the clouds and we see a long grassy ridge about a thousand yards in front, but commanding our ridge. About 8 a.m. the Boers open a terrific fire from every place except our extreme rear. We take the best cover we can get. Captain Birch gets shot in the head just above the eye. The fire is terrible. Ever so much heavier than what I had seen before or since. Boer reinforcements now hurried up this slope behind the Boer lines. One of the newcomers was 17-year-old Denise Rates. Denise wrote an account of his war, which has been translated by his grandson, Michael. The mountain rose above us, as steep as a wall, and it was no easy climb, passing a trail of corpses on the way. Halfway to the top, I found Robbie Reinecke lying dead. When I reached the top of Spionkop, I discovered that the burghers had advanced no further than the first line of rocks, right on the rim of the plateau and that the rest of the flat summit was still in the hands of the enemy. The nearest English were behind a long, low stone wall, no more than 30 yards away, from where they kept up a vicious fire on us with their Lee methods. The Boers now used a signaler on Spion Cop to direct their artillery fire precisely onto the British trench. The accuracy of the Boer gunners was devastating. Around nine in the morning, General Woodgate, the British officer commanding Spion Cop, was mortally wounded. A doom-laden message was sent by heliograph. Reinforce at once, or all lost. General dead. General Buller sensed the rising panic and sent an order to Warren. Unless you put some really good, hard fighting men in command on the top, you will lose the hill. I suggest Thornycroft. But it took hours for the message to reach Thornycroft, pinned down in this trench. No one knew who was in command, and the situation was deteriorating. By about one o'clock, the suffering, the losses, was awful. It was hot, hot, hot. P 
people were thirsty, people were tired, and there were still many, many hours of daylight ahead. Behind here lay many dead, many wounded, and there was no end in sight. This was a fatal spear on cop, and the sun pouring down. The shells dropping everywhere. You could see the poor chap shot down like skittle pins. The most awful scene of carnage. Men blown to atoms, joints torn asunder, headless bodies, trunks of bodies. Awful, awful. Copy of letter from Colonel Thornycroft, Spear and Cop, to Sir Charles Warren, 2.30 p.m., 24th of January, 1900. We are badly in need of water. There are many killed and wounded. If you really wish to make a certainty of the hill for the night, you must send more infantry and attack enemy's guns. But General Warren, two miles away in his camp, had no idea where exactly on Spion Cop his troops were. Fearing the British might get hit by their own artillery, he did not shell the enemy's guns. For their part, the Boers on Spion Cop were under such intense fire from Thornycroft's men that, ironically, they too felt they were losing the battle. The original Burgers, who had attacked early that morning, were holding on to the barren rock perimeter, all the while in the burning sun, under severe fire and unable to advance further. As a result, their courage started to weaken, and imperceptibly, many began to slip down the hill. Meanwhile, relentless Boer artillery destroyed the British signalling position here, smashing the heliograph. No one had remembered to bring oil for the signal lamp. Thornycroft felt increasingly abandoned, while the generals dithered below. By sunset, the British were on their last legs. Regret to report that I have been obliged to abandon Spear and Cop, as the position has become untenable. I have withdrawn the troops in regular order and will come to report as soon as possible. Alex Thornycroft, Lieutenant Colonel. So he had taken an awesome responsibility, but I think he really had very little option. He knew he was going to get criticised because he wrote to his brother. That's why the, yeah, the And he said, I, I'm writing this letter in case anything happens to me, so that you will know exactly what happens. And he goes through all the reasons why he, he, he decided to do it. Yeah. So he knew he was going to get flagged. Mm. As darkness fell, the British and Boers retreated down their sides of the hill, each believing the battle lost. But one man was actually climbing Spion Cop. Winston Churchill had daringly escaped from prison and joined the army. He was sent up. Britain had suffered a run of defeats in the opening months of the Boer War. As 1900 progressed, the tide seemed to turn in their favour. But the war was changing, not ending. It was increasingly a war against civilians. Britain had gone to war in October 1899 to beat the Boers and secure South Africa for the Empire. It was now the largest army to leave Britain's shores since Agincourt. The aim was to sweep up from the Cape, overrun the Orange Free State capital of Bloemfontein, and then into the Transvaal to Pretoria. But from the start, the Boers had besieged British garrisons in Kimberley, Ladysmith and Mafeking. Now the British army was split up and bogged down, trying to break through to the besieged towns. South London schoolboy Arthur Whitlock followed the war closely. These sieges of the three main towns, they impressed me very much by the way in which they were so stubborn 
getting short of food, other supplies, and uh, they stood it out against all odds, really. And I thought that was a marvellous tribute to our British nature. Beyond the outer British lines of defence were the Boers, dug in on hill and veldt. Their huge siege guns lobbed shells into the towns. Lookouts watched for telltale puffs of smoke on the hills beyond and warned the inhabitants to take cover. Women and children fell victim to Boer shelling and rifle fire. The Boers were told the exact positions of the women's encampment, convent and hospital in Mafeking, so they could avoid them. But they were hit too often for it to be an accident. The Boers became known as women slayers. Colonel Robert Baden-Powell was in charge at Mafeking. He sent an official complaint to the Boer general, which prophetically anticipated the course the war was to take. You have altered the usual conditions of war. You are making it one of people against people in which women are considered as belligerents. I warn you that the consequence of this may shortly be very serious to your own people. One of the dangers the British faced in the besieged towns was low morale. During the siege, people were cooped up all the time, but it was a gentleman's war because they had a truce on Sunday. They didn't fight on Sunday. And so on those Sundays, they used to have cricket matches and tent pegging. But in the Masonic Lodge, my mother said that they used to do all the Gilbert and Sullivan operas. I was very good at that sort of thing. And those, those people had very good voices, singing all the old songs. But that has how they... And, of course, he was very good at putting on a turn himself, because he's a man of many parts. He was a master of bluff. He had to be because his defenders of Mafeking were very few, and they had very little equipment. And one of the stories that is told is the defence around their forts wasn't very good, so they had the bright idea of putting up barbed wire fences which didn't exist. They planted some poles, and everybody who approached had to step over the barbed wire, which they did solemnly, stepping over nothing. For my military knowledge, though I'm plucky and adventurous, has only been brought down to the beginning of the century, but still in matters vegetable and ever the middle, I have the very model of a modern major general. <laughs> I think there's that sort of inner resilience amongst the British people. And when we're in time of trouble and such like, we can very often laugh ourselves out of it, where other nations, they can't understand that we're laughing at ourselves and saying, well, uh, we're a dog's body, but let's get on with it. And eventually we fight our way through. Baden-Powell's strict censorship and relentless self-publicity have conspired to give an impression that the sieges were an exclusively white experience, depending on bulldog grit and resourcefulness. In fact, blacks outnumbered whites by five to one here in Mafeking. In Kimberley, 10,000 black diamond workers were penned up in compounds. There were several thousand Indians in Ladysmith all caught up in a war not of their making and suffering for it. 
Very few had bomb shelters. My grandmother and my mother had no protection. Shelter for them meant leaving their houses and hiding behind a mound of earth or under trees. They lay flat on the ground, my mother with a baby on her back, and the shells flew over their heads and landed on their houses. One of the best chroniclers of the siege lived here in the heart of Mafeking's black community. He was a member of the Baralong people. 23 years old, he spoke eight languages and worked as the court interpreter. His name was Sol Plaki. Later a founding father of the African National Congress, he kept a diary from which his grandson reads. It's now Thursday, the 7th of December, 1899. The first shell of this morning burst near one of the railway cottages and killed a young fellow by blowing off his belly and pitching his intestines onto the opposite roof. I have never before realized so keenly that I am walking on the brink of the grave. Boer shelling killed and maimed more blacks than whites because the whites had shelters, which the blacks had to build for them. Racial discrimination was a fact of life then. On the eve of the war, a troop called Savage South Africa had visited England to perform scenes from past battles with Britain. Oh, they were just niggers. We had nothing against them. But they were niggers, and we used to say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, cuts the nigger by the toe. If he squeals, let him go. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, when we wanted to say who had to be it, if you know what being it is. They reenacted the defeat of the Matabele. We didn't mean any harm. We were quite pleased to think about the niggers. They were more than a pleasant thought for Baden Powell. Desperately short of soldiers in Mafeking, he armed the blacks, breaking both the Boer and British taboo. Had the Boer gevoel that that verkeerde beleid zou wees. The Boers felt that it would be wrong to involve blacks in this war. So did Sir Alfred Milner. He felt it would be bad policy to involve blacks in this war because the effect on a post-war situation would be tremendous with claims for more territory and for the general right to vote. And for the Boers, it was a case of, this is our war. It has nothing to do with the black man. Boer General Piet Cronier wrote to Baden-Powell in protest. You have committed an enormous act of wickedness. Reconsider the matter, even if it cost you the loss of Mafeking. Disarm your blacks and thereby act the part of a white man in a white man's war. In fact, General Cronier himself armed blacks during the siege of Mafeking. Blacks also acted as couriers, with messages hidden in their clothes. The penalty of court was death. The British even had a black woman courier. My grandmother was a brave person. She was well known for her bravery. That's why the English chose her to carry secret messages. She carried a letter sewn inside her dress to an English outpost. The blacks fought the Boers and raided their cattle. They took the land's share of the risks, the whites got the land's share of the food. 
Ironically, much of the food belonged to the blacks in the first place. Baden-Powell commandeered it and then sold it back to them as rations. The natives are getting a little suspicious of us. They want to know why we are trying to take all the grain from them. A man in Mafeking is sentenced to death for stealing a goat. Under Baden-Powell, blacks were flogged for the first two offences and executed for the third. Standing at the back, the court interpreter, Sol Plaki. We have very great difficulty in feeding the natives. I saw horse flesh for the first time being treated as human foodstuff. It looked like meat with nothing unusual about it. But when they found that there was no more meat left and brought the heads and feet, I was moved to see their long ears and bald heads. And those were the things the people are to feed on. The recipients, however, were all very pleased to get these heads and they ate them nearly raw. Horse was a key ingredient in the black soup kitchens, as Ina Cowan noted in her diary. An old horse is slaughtered, skinned, and thrown into a huge boiler with some villainous mealy meal and salt, and is doled out at threepence a pint. J. E. Neely of the Pall Mall Gazette described the queues of blacks. Five or six hundred of both sexes and all ages, a waiting turn to crawl painfully up to the soup kitchen. It was one of the most heartrending sights I have ever witnessed. As they lost weight, their eyes bulged out of their sockets. My grandmother said that to supplement this soup, they went to the river and ate mud to give them something more in the stomach. My mother said they had a little fox terrier. Her name was Vicky, and she was a miniature fox terrier, which they used to have to hide. Because as food got scarcer and scarcer, if the Africans particularly got hold of a dog, I mean, it didn't last very long, they killed it to eat. So every, everybody was always looking after Vicky and hiding her so that nobody would take her to eat. To make the food last, Baden-Powell had one more trick. Expel all blacks not essential to Mafeking's defence. Stocks at present will last to June the 12th. But by forcing natives away, we can get their share for whites. Tonight, no fewer than 750 natives have to walk 100 miles through Boer lines. Our outposts have orders to shoot at them if they return. It does seem hard. When a start was made from the river, there arose cries of mama, mama, children shouting after their mothers and women after their children. The Boers caught, stripped and flogged many of the women. Some they killed. Those who got past the Boers faced a slower death, as J. Neely witnessed. I saw them lie where they had fallen, too weak to go on their way, mostly little boys. Probably hundreds died from starvation, or the diseases that always accompany famine. The British army had been inching closer to the three besieged towns. On the 15th of February 1900, Kimberley was relieved. The breakthrough had begun. Boer General Piet Cronier, with 5,000 men, fell back in retreat from Kimberley. They had huge ox trains, heavily dependent on black labour. The main trade that the men undertook at the time 
was to transport with their beautiful wagons. And my father was a teenager, and his job was to be Tolea. That is the man who leads the oxen. And it is this wagon which was chosen to carry the wife of General Kronjeh. Hester Cronier accompanied her husband. They were attacked by the British. Shots were coming from all sides, and then they would hit the oxen in their run, and says the way you would know that an ox has been hit would be when it fell on its knees and it made the sound, oh, and fell down. And his uncle would come with a sharp knife and cut off the straw, that is the, the leather cord that holds the yoke to the neck. And they would leave the ox there and run on until the next one is hit and the same thing would happen. And that is how my father contributed to the Boer, to the Boer War, saved General Grunje's wife. He never told us that the Kronjiers came to say thank you for that. But Mrs. Cronier was only safe for a moment. Instead of fleeing to the north, her husband decided to dig his 5,000 men in along the banks of the river Modder at Paderberg. But 15,000 British soldiers were hard on his heels. It was now the Boers' turn to be surrounded. Boer General Christian de Vett implored Cronier to break out, but he was too encumbered with baggage wagons and families to risk it. Rina Villian's father was with de Vett. My father, said that My father told us they'd sent a message to Cronier telling him that they were going to drive a safe corridor through the English lines. And the minute they'd done that, Cronje and his men must flee down it. He shouldn't take any wagons with him, just troops on horseback, and they had to move as fast as possible. But Cronje didn't react. When the safe passage was created, he just stayed put. De Vett and the other Boers were miserable because the whole commander of the Orange Free State was captured there. And after that, the Boer troops were very disheartened. Cronier surrendered to Field Marshal Lord Roberts on the 27th of February, 1900. It was the first major British victory and a turning point in the war. Over 4,000 Boers were taken prisoner, a devastating blow. Of dare bange vlinder sag Cronier was filmed peering out of the cart taking him into captivity A tortel duifse sange With his wife and army Cronier was exiled to the island of St Helena following in Napoleon's footsteps Punch showed him greeting Napoleon's ghost with the words same enemy, sire. Same result. Cronier and Hester lived out the war on St. Helena. They then went to America, where he reenacted the Battle of Paderberg at the 1904 St. Louis World Fair. He died hated by his people. The British breakthrough gathered momentum. In Natal, they relieved Ladysmith. They pushed the Boers back at Trefontaine on the Western Front. When the British reached this final ridge, they saw the Boers fleeing on horseback on the way clear to Bloemfontein, capital of the Orange Free State. The city fell without a fight on the 13th of March, 1900. Yet a thousand would die here, but not from Boer guns. And the seeds of the tragedy were sown weeks, even months before.
I know my father said that some of the water that he had to drink during the campaign he would be absolutely horrified. Contaminated by dead animals and all that sort of thing. Disease was a major problem. They were having to drink untreated water virtually from day to day and from stream to stream. So it was never the same water uh, and hence there was a far greater uh, chance of picking up something from the water. Typhoid is one of the gastrointestinal diseases. It is an organism that affects the gut. It is characteristic of large standing armies. Spread by water, by food, by dust, by flies, of which there were millions. For months, thousands of British troops had been living along the River Modder, swimming in it, washing in it, drinking it. At Paderberg, a thousand dead horses and cattle had been carried away down it. The water was alive with typhoid. Warnings were given and ignored. It's hot, it's dry, it's dusty, it's very hot. And they've marched, are they thirsty? Who now has the inclination to ladle out a bit of water, boil it, have it cooled and then drink it? It just doesn't happen. So that by the time they move, that army is incubating typhoid. They come as victors into Bloemfontein, and then the typhoid strikes them. And they died miserably. They really did. Feverish, dehydrated, diarrhea, delirious. It was not pleasant. It is not a kind disease. George Graham survived a bout of typhoid, then called enteric and wrote home about conditions in hospital. Some of the men have great blowflies alight upon them, and these rapidly turn into maggots. And one poor fellow was unlikely to recover, for he had nearly a pailful taken away from him. They laid their eggs upon our blankets, and you can tell the rest. There were severe shortages, but General Kitchener told one doctor you want pills and I want bullets, and bullets come first. There was indifference at the top and bureaucracy in the middle, so the men died. Nurse Kate Driver worked in Ladysmith, where the death toll reached 400. He lay quietly, in great pain. Oh, my little nursey, I'm a goner, he said. I could see, too, that he was a goner. I tried to persuade him otherwise, and tried to get knowledge of his relations. In case I kick the bucket, he said, looking at me. I could not tell him yes. Two-thirds of the British soldiers who lost their lives in the Boer War died not of wounds, but disease. Four days after Bloemfontein fell, the Boer leaders met to work out a new way forward. The ideas of younger generals like Christian de Vett, Coeurs de la Rey and Louis Botta now emerged. No more fighting the British head-on in pitched battles. No more cumbersome baggage trains. The future lay in mobile units raiding behind British lines, a guerrilla war. Fresh life was breathed into the Boer struggle, inspiring a new generation of officers like Marnie Moritz. The general my father spoke most about was de la Rey, whom he fought under for quite a time. 
He always said to me, if I had to name a great warrior, it would be General de la Rey. He used to go into battle with this great nose, hooked like an eagle's beak, and his beard blowing in the wind. He could inspire any man to go to war. The trouble was, disillusioned Boers had been drifting home following the recent run of defeats. And many more accepted a British offer of amnesty, as long as they swore allegiance to the crown and gave up their weapons. Johannes Swanepoel did just that and was branded a traitor, or joiner, as his nephew recalls. My uncle became a joiner, and you can understand it from his point of view. He saw they had no hope of winning the war once the English had conquered our capital, Bloemfontein. He and others came to the conclusion that it was time to end the war. That's why he became a joiner. He also wanted to return to his farm. He didn't want to fight anymore. General de Vett realized he had to sort out the committed from the waverers in his ranks. De Vett told his men, go home to your farms, sort everything out there and meet me again at Sand River. That way, only the ones who really wanted to fight would return. And that was precisely what happened. On the 25th of March, de Wet was rejoined by a group of burghers with the real courage to go on. And that was de Wet's whole idea. Give me a hundred men who want to fight, rather than a thousand who aren't interested in defending their own freedom. <laughs> On the 24th of April, 1900, HMS Powerful brought the survivors of the Ladysmith siege home to a hero's welcome. As these various places were relieved, there was a great response of the people here, but I think most of all it was when we came to the final one of Mafeking, when there was a tremendous outcry of joy amongst the people there. The relief of Mafeking. Oh, that was a happy night in Glasgow. My mother said, the whole theatre in that night just emptied at once. And each, everybody ran to the public house for a drink. They were that happy to know that, that there would be some men come home from Mafeking. It was a time of very great rejoicing. And we thought we'd turn the corner then. The British Army now rolled into the Transvaal beckoned by its twin prizes, the capital Pretoria and the gold mines of Johannesburg. Crossing 300 miles of veldt was tough on men and their mounts. But the infantrymen, or Tommies, had the worst of it. Kipling uh, brought out a poem and that had particular reference to the marching. And it came on the lines of Boots, 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 moving up and down again. There's no discharge in the war. We'll put, 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 slogging over Africa. Put, 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 slogging over Africa. Boots, 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 moving up and down again. There's no discharge in the war. The ordinary soldiers won the respect of officers like Captain March Phillips. Sit down by this group of Tommies by the waterhole in the midday halt. They're tired and hungry and footsore. You thought you were roughing it. But look at these men. Look at their unaffected cheeriness. We can kick out hunger, thirst or weariness, but not the British Army, like a plague of locusts, left a trail of devastation across South Africa. On one level, it was a simple case of hungry troops coming across well-stocked Boer farmhouses. 
if they went into a farm and the farm was empty, things like that, there were always chickens and, and ducks and animals and things round about, and then they would help themselves to that. Um, but there was nobody else to help themselves to that. I mean, if they didn't, somebody else would. I mean, and it wasn't just the officers, it was, I mean, everybody. But it went beyond stealing poultry, as Captain Phillips observed. Looting is one of Tommy's perpetual joys. Not merely looting for profit, though I have seen Tommies take possession of the most ridiculous things, with a vague idea of carting them home somehow, but looting for the sheer fun of the destruction. From early 1900, they burned farmhouses, particularly those owned by fighting Boers. Lord Roberts of Kandahar was not unduly concerned about this kind of behaviour. People who are fighting against us cannot expect that their property will be altogether respected. Scorched earth and reprisals were standard weapons of colonial warfare. In recent British conflicts, commanded by Lord Roberts and Lord Kitchener, Afghan villages had been burned, the Sudan plundered, people starved into submission. The British started to treat the Boers as just another kind of savage tribesman to be brought to heel. On the 5th of June 1900, the British moved unopposed into Pretoria, capital of the Transvaal. Amid the rejoicing, Captain March Phillips smelt a rat. It is generally considered rather a coup in war, I believe, to take the enemy's capital, isn't it? We keep on taking capitals, but I can't say it seems to make much difference. The Boers go on fighting after their loss, just as if nothing had happened. Indeed, Roberts made it easier for the Boers to carry on by giving their army 24 hours to get clear if the Boers left the Johannesburg gold mines intact. So the Boers escaped, taking the last boxes of gold mined on the Rand. Punch magazine showed Paul Kruger fleeing from Pretoria with a fortune in his saddlebag. Rumours about Kruger's gold persist to the present day. The British wanted our gold and land, and um Paul's money. He went off with it. I know where that money is. They can shoot me dead. I'll never say where it is. The Boers retreated into the mountains of the eastern Transvaal fighting a series of rearguard actions against the advancing British. Kruger was spirited over the border into Portuguese East Africa and safety. He next showed up on a whistle-stop tour of European capital cities, drumming up moral support for the Boers. The intervention they wanted was, we're not asking for military aid from France or Germany or anywhere. We just want you to send Britain a diplomatic note saying, please give this bunch of Boers their freedom back. That's what they really want. Kruger got little more than cheers and sympathy. But the Boer cause was seen as increasingly fashionable in Europe. Images of brave Boers were used to sell meat sauce, underwear, fizzy water, cocoa. By mid-1900, some Boers were fighting a guerrilla war. Christian de Vett destroyed lines of communication, hit British columns, then escaped into thin air. He frustrated the British in South Africa and fascinated them at home. Schoolboys in England collected cigarette cards of the Boer commandants. They prized one above all others. De Wet, to my mind, was a, a fly-by-night type of figure, and for that reason, young as I was, I admired him, although he was an enemy. 
And as I say, he flitted from place to place, uh, causing damage to our troops in a way before we could retaliate. Wie is die dapper generaal de wet? Wie strijd so dapper in Transvaal de wet? In 1901, de Wet was the hero of a comic film shot on a hillside in Lancashire. The Boers celebrated his bravery in song. In August 1900, de Wet found himself trapped in the Transvaal with 250 men. Behind him, the British in full pursuit across this plain. In front of him, the Michalisberg Mountains, a barrier of rock between De Wet and freedom. Well, here we are on the terrain where General De Wet performed one of his most famous escapes during the Boer War. It was the 21st of August 1900, and it's not too far away from... Historians Franz Johann Pretorius and Ian Copley pick up De Wet's trail at the deceptively easy foot of the slope where De Wet performed this escape. They take two horses with them. A century ago, De Wet and his men had 250. The only way out was to go over the mountains. So De Wet approached an African, and this was one of the most famous conversations of the Anglo-Boer War. And he said to him, is there a path over here? The man said, no, master, there's no path. And he said, but have people gone here before? He said, long ago. And De Wet asked him, but is it the road, the path of the baboons? The man said, yes, baboons, but not people. And De Wet said to his men, come on, men, where baboons can pass, we can pass too. We've got to pass, otherwise we'll be caught. De Wet gave his horses their last drink here. There is no more water until the far side of the mountain. Now we get into the top of the tree line, it gets more rough and sturdy than ever. Yes, uh, it's actually from here that they got off their horses and started climbing the mountain. You can see how difficult it is, at this, even at this stage of the climb, that the horses are quite having a struggle. Come on, come on. Come on, let's go back to the Free State. Come on, come on, come on. The horses didn't want to go any further. Their counterparts a century ago weren't given the choice. De Wet was a hard taskmaster. But the popular depictions of his escapes made it look like magic. Five o'clock on a winter's afternoon. Almost dark. And they reached the top. You know, the De Wet said he had climbed many mountains, but never before had he been so tired. But the exhaustion was, was rewarded by the lovely panorama that he had here to the south. That's an incredible view, isn't it? Yes. And the, the best of it all, there was no British soldier in sight. <laughs> There's this lovely story of this young boy selling picture postcards of General de Wet in London. And they were all in envelopes. And everybody was buying. And this one fellow came back and said, but look, my envelope is empty. There's nothing inside. The boy said, oh, General de Wet must have escaped again. <laughs> The British response to Boer guerrilla tactics went far beyond legitimate countermeasures. From June 1900, destruction of Boer property was widespread and ruthless. General Kelly Kenny had used the expression lay waste in an order and was asked to define it. Destroy what you cannot eat. Burn all farmhouses. Search for hidden stores of ammunition and destroy what you find.
As far as the options were concerned, something that keeps on rising in all these conversations about the scorched, scorched earth policy, it was a war. It was a total war. There was no option. I'm not concerned here with the morality of the war, who was to blame and who wasn't. But what I'm concerned about is, if you look at it from a military historian's point of view, it was a war. The aim was to win it. Captain March Phillips was with Remington's Tigers. They scouted ahead of the main army, plundering and destroying. Our course through the country is marked, as in prehistoric ages, by pillars of smoke by day and fire by night. We usually burn from six to a dozen farms a day. If the Boers have used the farm, if the owner is on commando, if the line within a certain distance has been blown up, we find that one reason or other generally covers pretty nearly every farm we come to. And so to save trouble, we burn the lot. Blacks fighting with the British were an integral part of these operations. My father did, in fact, join, shall I say, parties that burned houses and uh, robbed farms and all this of it. That's why it was lucrative business to join and uh, forage in these farm houses and all and set them on fire and uh, all that. It was part of the game, as it were. We take the boars and burn the houses, as simple as that. You collect whatever you can and then uh, start holding on fire because the idea was to avoid these boars having a place where to hide. That was the main thing. It was part of the war strategy. Many British, like Captain Bromley Davenport, felt little sympathy for the Boers. I burnt the farm in revenge. There was a woman there, very fat and unpardonably ugly. I had no pity for her at all. The women here are worse than the men and should be made to suffer with them. But Captain March Phillips felt distinctly uncomfortable. The worst moment is when you come to the house. The people thought we had called for refreshments and one of the women went to get milk. Then we had to tell them we had come to burn the place down. I simply did not know which way to look. The old grandmother was very angry. She told me that though I was making a fine blaze now, it was nothing compared to the flames that I myself should be consumed in hereafter. The women cried and the children stood by holding on to them and looking with large, frightened eyes at the burning house. They won't forget that sight. I'll bet a sovereign, not even when they grow up. Christina Nianaba hasn't forgotten, though a hundred years have passed. And the old Farkis for the Havas, Klein Farkis, so she made a deal her cup. And the owners do it. The little piglets they just chopped in half. Killed some chickens and chased the others around. And two. And then they set the house alight. I almost forgot. My mother said I was still in the house when they started to burn it. So she ran to go and grab me. My hair was singed by then. I was small. I always say that's why I'm soft in the head. Then we went to the wagon with all our stuff. She could not climb up quickly enough. So the officer said, My mother said, Turn around, I'll kick you in your ass. I'm sorry, lady. I didn't know you could speak English. And then my mother got into the wagon and we went off to the camp. Roberts had started to sweep the families of Boers still fighting off the veldt into concentration camps. The deaths in these camps would reverberate around the world to Britain's shame. But that still lay in the future.
Roberts thought the war was as good as over. Someone else could mop up. In December 1900, he went home to an earldom, promotion, and £100,000 in cash. Troops also returned. The city imperial volunteers were welcomed as victors. There was a mass exodus, too, of war correspondents, racing back to publish their Boer War bestsellers. But the Boers weren't writing their memoirs yet. A young Boer woman, Johanna Brandt, overheard an exhausted British soldier saying, Thank God the war is over. She replied, Tommy Atkins, the war has just begun. The man chosen to mop up in South Africa was Kitchener, whose hardline methods only stiffened the resolve of those Boer men and women prepared to fight to the end. Things weren't too bad before, but with Kitchener, forget it. He was a murderer. Before, they left women on the farms. But with him, it was goodbye. Then everybody had to go. He had no qualms. How much innocent blood flowed here? How much? I think the guerrilla war started in an attempt by the Boer leaders to cause as much unpleasantness to the British forces as they possibly could, in the hope that they would eventually get fed up with it all and there'd be some sort of a peace. I think that was what really what was behind it. And then, of course, Lord Kitchener decided on his scorched earth, earth policy and the concentration camps and all that sort of thing, which has left a bad taste ever since. The mortuary at Kroonstadt camp. The piles of coffins. The bereaved women. I don't know how many funerals there were a day. People said that if you put all the mother's tears together, you'd have enough to fill a dam. I can remember them saying that. By 1901, with set piece battles a thing of the past, the question was how to win the war. Britain's answer was to fill South Africa with barbed wire and concentration camps. The British outnumbered the Boers 10 to 1. But beyond the cities, which the British controlled, it seemed like bandit country. Captain March Phillips described the predicament in a letter home. It is bad country for our business. To us, mountain ranges are not fine scenery, but strong positions. Rocks and crags are not picturesque, but merely good cover. We always serve out extra ammunition when we come to a pretty bit of scenery. The British struggled across barren landscapes. They clung to defensive positions. They felt uneasy and impotent. The veldt is a void to us. The enemy are watching us now from a rise a few miles away, waiting for our next move. They are all round and about us, like water round a ship, parting before our bows and reuniting round our stern. Our passage makes no impression and leaves no visible trace. But the Boers left plenty of traces. Ah, 
dan zo stil met jou. Zo lang genoeg al gerkeerd, het is tijd dat ons gaan trouwen. Oh, mijn gerke, ik zal nooit meer, nooit meer. The whole British Army depended for its supply on a fragile railway network. In January 1901, Kitchener began a building scheme to protect lines and junctions from Boer attack. They were the last English castles. A chain of blockhouses across the landscape, one in sight of the next, fenced between with barbed wire. The usual garrison was an NCO and six infantrymen, plus armed blacks, much used for sentry duty at night. It became a system not just for protecting the railway, but for catching Boers. Mobile columns would sweep the veldt, driving the Boers towards the blockhouse lines where armoured trains would administer the death blow. That, at any rate, was the theory. The Boer general, Christian de Vett, called it the blockhead system. The English were so busy building blockhouses that they had no time to fight us, and it was all money thrown away. A dark night, a bit of ingenuity, and a pair of wire cutters were all de Vett needed to beat the system. Will Saxon served in blockhouses near Harrismith. He found time to sketch and write home to his sweetheart, Mary. The blockhouses are placed on eminences with from one to three miles distance between them. We are pretty safe here. We have open country in front. We have ammunition and biscuits and bully beef enough to withstand a month or more. I got a parcel of tobacco from you last week. Tonight we shall have mosquitoes by the million. Niggers patrol the barbed wire entanglements between blockhouses. They will do anything for a white man. It is ten o'clock. Four of the garrison are playing whist for their rum rations. Some are asleep. One is studying geometry. Give my regards to your mother. I am yours till lights out, and after. Will. Will Saxon survived the war, returning home to marry Mary. But lives were lost in the blockhouses, successful as they became at reducing Boer sabotage. Haute Kral Stasi in the flatlands of the Orange Free State. A cluster of graves near the site of an old blockhouse. Almost certainly those of 14 black soldiers killed by the Boers while guarding the blockhouse for Britain. British frustration grew as the Boers moved freely across the veldt, supported by civilians on farms. Bam. My grandmother always cooked food for them. She put it in a hole outside because she couldn't have them in the house. Then they go there at night to eat. They knew which hole to go to and look in, where food would be hidden for them. Obviously something had to be done about it because uh, the boys were being supplied by their families and things like that on the farms. And um, the idea of the concentration camp was to get all the, all the farm folk, the families, into an area where they couldn't assist their husbands who were fighting the British. Commander-in-Chief Lord Roberts had started clearing the Boers into concentration camps in 1900 borrowing an idea first used by Spain in 1896 to crush rebellion in Cuba. 
Roberts' successor in South Africa, Lord Kitchener, stepped up the policy. All possible means shall be taken to stop the present guerrilla warfare. One that has lately been successfully tried on a small scale is the removal of all men, women and children and natives from the districts which the enemy bands persistently occupy. The women and children brought in should be camped near the railway for supply purposes. The ordnance will supply the necessary tents and the district commissioner will look after the food. A farm in the Orange Free State, burned by the British in 1900. One of perhaps 30,000 destroyed in the process of clearing the veldt. Boer families watched as all they had worked for was put to the torch. Then to the camps. A miserable journey made a century ago by Christina Nianaba. They chased everyone to the camp. Those who could not ride simply had to walk to the camps. People couldn't stay in their houses. The houses had all been burned. Many, many people were in the camps. If only my mother were alive, she'd tell you. They were crammed into tents, giving little protection against South Africa's extreme climate. Not all the camps were fenced in, but the people weren't free to leave. This helped the Boers, who couldn't look after their families and fight a guerrilla war. In some camps, the sanitation was dire, the food appalling. Christina Nia Naba was here in Potschipstrom. My mother said it was tough in the camp. What do I know? I was a child. In our tent, we were three women and four children. We just had to fend for ourselves. She said once a week we got a little piece of meat, which they then had to cook outside. Of course, there were no stoves. She just had to make a fire. This is how we lived. This is how we got our food and stuff. And the children got sick and five children died. My sister died, my brother died. Mama was miserable about her children. The site today of Christina's concentration camp at Potschefstrom. The names of her sister Maria and brother Christian are inscribed on the death roll. 26,000 Boer women and children, 10% of their population, died in Britain's white concentration camps in South Africa. I think one must look upon the camps, and I'm not going to try to justify anything one way or the other, as a manifestation of the frustration felt by the British High Command. The war would not come to an end. They had no answer for guerrilla warfare. None of the things they knew worked. They saw the farms as sources of food, of shelter for these roving commanders. So put them in camps. 
But the people who do that have no idea of how you organize a civilian camp. How closely do you group people together? How do you see to the drainage of the soil, latrines, the water supply? Unfortunately, with a large number of people in a small area, and I imagine probably not an awful lot of um, medicines available, uh, things got out of hand and they just the medical authorities just couldn't cope with the amount of disease which was prevalent in the concentration camps at that particular time. Hopelessly overwhelmed camp hospitals suddenly faced epidemics of measles, pneumonia, dysentery, typhoid. Diseases unknown to most Boers out on the veldt. They have lived in isolation now for virtually a hundred years. Healthy people, but a people in isolation. And when they are exposed suddenly to a large influx of people from outside, they come into contact with the organisms that carry the disease, particularly measles. It is a devastating disease for an unexposed community. Ach, my heart is in my tranen, my ogen, see ek myne kleinste aan, die vooral toos weg moes gaan. In my heart is nu doorsnydend, want wat moet my kleinste leiden. Hier lag sy met grote pijn, maar God sal haar leidsman sy. When the authorities learned there was a sick child in your tent, they took that child to a hospital. And the Boer women strongly believed that within three days that child would be dead. So if a child became ill, you just hid him in the tent and kept him there, so that when they inspected the tents, they would not know that there was a sick child there. Alival North concentration camp by the Cry River in the Orange Free State. 546 children would perish here. As death rates rose, some Boer mothers began to fear that the British were trying to kill them. A gulf of suspicion opened up. The British doctors told the Boers to keep their tents well ventilated, and they restricted the diet of dysentery and typhoid sufferers. But the Boers thought they were being frozen and starved to death. Rumours abounded of infected meat, of poison in the medicine, ground glass in the flour and sugar. The concentration camps were regarded by the nation as genocide. My own aunt, who was in the camp with my father, told me that every day they'd strain their flour through a very fine gauze sieve to remove bits of glass from the flour. They couldn't use it straight from the sack. Whether these things were orchestrated from the top or whether it was unfavorable conditions is not for me to say. I only know that a lot of research is done on it today and there are very strong theories that a form of genocide went hand in hand with the terrifyingly high mortality rate in the camps. There were some exceptionally good ones. There were some that were very badly run. There were some that were grotesquely inefficient. But um, to say that this was a policy of genocide, which some people have claimed, is absolute... Well, I was going to use a rude word. I'll just say tripe. 
We must state clearly that the aim of the concentration camps was not genocide. What happened there was just poor administration, but particularly poor administration by the British Army authorities. The British had shown scant regard for the health of their own men. Thousands of Tommies had already died of disease. The welfare of the enemy was an even lower priority. Kitchener fobbed off inquiries about the camps, saying the inmates were happy and conditions improving. But in mid-1901, the truth leaked out, and the whistleblower was neither an outraged Boer nor an intrepid journalist, but a well-connected liberal from Cornwall, Emily Hobhouse. My part from Svartel. My father told us that one particular day they were ordered to stand in front of their tents. A lady from England had arrived called Emily Hobhouse. He saw her and she was dressed beautifully. And you know they were ashamed of their mothers who were so neglected in their old tattered clothes and their faces uncared for, their hair uncombed. But he saw her. She had a gentle face and she spoke to them in English, which he didn't really understand. And after she left, things improved in the camp. Emily Hobhouse had heard unconfirmed reports about farm burnings and the plight of Boer women and children. A campaigner for social welfare, she reached South Africa in January 1901. Nearly a century ago, she walked down this path to meet Annie Strauss, the local Boer woman who would guide her around Springfontein concentration camp. Jennifer Hobhouse Balm follows in her great aunt's footsteps. Her guide is Annie Strauss's great granddaughter, Suzanne. Hello. Hello. You must be Suzanne. I am, and you must be Jennifer. That's Pleased right. to meet you. Right. Welcome here. Emily Hobhouse sat here with Suzanne's great grandmother, Annie, distributing clothes to the women from Springfontein Camp next door. She had visited other camps but nowhere else had she seen such extreme poverty. A few months after Emily's visit, Annie Strauss and her family were themselves moved into the camp. A precious memento has survived from that time. And this little doll, it was a present yes. for my grandma when she was in the refugee camp. Yes. You see, huh? there is her name and look there. Yes. It's the old little body. Yes. Corrie Isn't Strauss, that marvelous? Refugee Camp, Springfontein, June 1901. Well, I think this is the same one that uh, later on was a, quite a fuss about a child called Lizzie Van Zyl. And Emily had given her the doll, and you can just see the doll in the picture. Lizzie Van Zyl was one of a number of children Emily saw in varying stages of emaciation. The controversy arose because this photograph inspired a newspaper campaign in England blaming the Boers for their own misfortune. The theory put around was that the people were bad mothers and they weren't clean and of course they neglected their children and they used Dutch medicines, which were folk medicines, and that was what she had to answer. And Emily felt it was extremely unfair to try and blame it on the mothers. Suzanne takes Jennifer across the field, once crowded with tents and people, down to the wash place by the railway. With water in short supply, it was hard to keep clean, and the British controlled the access. It's the women concentration camp and the um, stones where they could wash their clothes and the bell that they used to call the people for their turn. It looks like a bit of old railway line. This was the piece, the bell that they used 
You see how many times they used it? And they... There was no soap in the rations when Emily came out here. Well, it was all right for the women who could buy things, but a lot of them had no money, and they, they were completely reliant on the rations that they were given, and that was a tragedy. Well, each tent had a tragedy. The more camps Emily visited, the more aware she became of the scale of the dying. I began to compare a parish I had known at home of 2,000 people, where a funeral was an event. Here, some 20 to 25 were carried away daily. The full realization of the position dawned upon me. It was a death rate such as had never been known except in the times of the great plagues. The whole talk was of death. Who died yesterday? Who lay dying today? Who would be dead tomorrow? Another child had died in the night. And I found all three little corpses being photographed for the absent fathers to see someday. Emily was devastated by the death rates amongst the, especially amongst the children. She loved children. She felt they were completely innocent. The women might support their husbands, but the children were really the, the brunt of the war was on them. Emily saw for herself how families suffered even before reaching the camps. On Springfontein railway station, she found 600 people huddled under trucks and makeshift canopies. To such a shelter, I was called to see a sick baby. The mother sat on her little trunk with the child across her knee. She had nothing to give it, and the child was sinking fast. I thought a few drops of brandy might save it, but though I had money, there was none to be had. I thought of the superintendent of the camp a mile off, and sent a hasty message to ask him to let me have some for a sick child. But the reply was that his supplies were only for his camp. There was nothing to be done, and we watched the child draw its last breath in reverent silence. The mother neither moved nor wept. It was her only child. Dry-eyed but deathly white, she sat there motionless, looking not at the child, but far, far away, into the depths of grief beyond all tears. This description of Emily's was to inspire the tableau at the heart of the Women's Memorial in Bloemfontein. She returned to England and wrote a report describing the camps urging reform, if not abolition, of the whole system. But her views were not welcome. Many people thought that Emily was a traitor, so they were very rude to Emily, a lot of people in the drawing rooms of London. They, if she was introduced, they'd turn their back, and um, they just weren't prepared to listen. But the Liberal opposition leader listened. Drawing on Emily's information, Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman publicly denounced the methods of barbarism being used against the Boers. The Daily News gave a full page to Emily's report on the camps, including her description of the misery she witnessed at Springfontein. A vociferous minority in Britain opposed the Boer War, some on moral, others on political grounds. Emily's revelations came as a godsend. But anti-war speakers like the young Liberal MP David Lloyd George had great difficulty getting their views across, as a silent feature film showed. The crowd branded him a traitor and rioted. 
the Tory establishment also went on the attack, exemplified by a contributor to the Times. The Boer women have proved themselves to be very dangerous enemies. We may admire their courage, but they have forfeited the right to be considered non-belligerents. But British High Commissioner in South Africa, Lord Milner, had no illusions in private about where the responsibility lay. While a hundred explanations may be offered and a hundred excuses made, they do not really add up to an adequate defence. The children will all be dead by the spring of 1903. Only I shall not be there to see, as the continuance of the present state of affairs will undoubtedly blow us all out of the water. By autumn 1901, Britain's concentration camps in South Africa were an international scandal. The European press reveled in Britain's shame. Edward VII deserved to hang for his country's crimes. Kitchener was a bloodthirsty monster. But not every Boer woman and child fell into his clutches. Some women, like Elizabeth Vandenberg, took drastic steps, as she told her daughter Ada. It was vital for them to hide themselves as well as possible. They were scared of the concentration camps. My mother had heard about lots of people, especially children, dying in the camps. And it concentrates the camp. Ada Prince Lou's mother escaped with a group of women into the mountains of the Eastern Free State. This cave was one of many hiding places women used in the Boer War. My oldest sister is Gebore Dar. My oldest sister was born in the cave. Seven babies in all were born in the cave. My fierce old auntie, her little girl, was also born there. Because they did not have water to bathe the children with, they smeared goat fat on her body to clean her up. One morning, Aunt Martha said that if she didn't get a cup of coffee, she'd die. The other women said to her, please, the mountain's crawling with English, we can't make a fire. But she said, English or no English, today I'm having coffee. She got some water and she gathered some bat droppings to make a fire. And the smoke had barely left the cave when guns and bayonets were pushed inside. The Brits were all over the place. And they said, hands up. Just before the women reached the concentration camp, they were rescued by a Boer commando. Mummy said that they just fled from one place to the next. The Karana Mountains are high and there are quite a few places to hide. So they got away and muddled along till the end of the war. Black loyalties were split. Some sided with the British, others remained loyal to the Boer families for whom they worked. Pauline McQuenna's mother went into hiding with her white mistress. My mother stayed with these women in the mountains. When the food was finished, my mother would go down to the village and look for food. When she had found some, she would take it back to them. She took it to the women living in the cave in the mountains. 
My mother and that white woman lived in the cave. She used to smear the woman with something like dye or paint or oil to disguise her as a black woman. Heeft burgers lieder vrijheid aan en zijn... Some women fled on ox wagons into the veld, keeping one jump ahead of British mobile columns. The traditional, subservient role of women in Boer society was changing. Responsibility for their family's survival on the veld and their defiant stoicism in the camps gave Boer women new authority, new commitment. In many ways, they had made the Boer cause their own. Some liked to be photographed holding guns. A handful actually went to war. Helena Herbst Wagner dressed in her husband's clothes and spent five months fighting alongside men before they realized her true identity. And there were others. Sarah Raal was so a forebuild. Sarah Rahl as an example. She was in the Springfontein concentration camp. She ran away and joined her brothers and father. And she was a commando in the Southern Free State. She carried a revolver. Interestingly enough, from her memoirs, one never learns if she had ever shot at British columns. But she did shoot at blacks who had killed Boers. And that was her justification for taking up arms. While their families bore the brunt of the war, the Boers took the fight across the Orange River into the British Cape Colony. The aim was to stir up their fellow Afrikaners in the Cape into rebellion. Britain's High Commissioner, Lord Milner, was terrified of an uprising, so troops patrolled the colony, hunting down the invading Boers and rebel Afrikaners. The war in the Cape was fragmented, Isolated skirmishes punctuating the constant hunt for supplies. The Boers lived off the land, appearing to some as heroic freedom fighters, to others as murderous thugs. In August 1901, Boer rebels arrived at a loyal British farmhouse in the Eastern Cape. Nora Featherstone was 11. In old age, she recorded her memories of that day. And they, they rushed into the house. They said, we want breakfast for 15, please. We didn't have one thing left in that house. They, they'd eaten up everything. And uh, they said to Mother, we're very sorry, but we've had orders to burn your house and your furniture. They, said they, they then yeah. said, if you can produce your husband, we will not burn the furniture or the house. So my grandmother said it's quite impossible. She didn't tell them, but my grandfather was with Gorringer's flying column, hunting those very Boers. They then said, well, we will not burn the furniture. They carried out every single thing, and all the glass doors were smashed. They had the most glorious time, they romping and jumping about. They had ransacked every room and they had stolen my grandmother's diamond ring and one of them went into Aunt Violet's room and put on her evening frock. The one had an evening dress on. And I am Miss Violet Fenston, he was dancing on the floor. He was dancing And the family were very upset. They then set fire to the house. We all stood in watched the poor roof falling in. But it's been really, very sad. It 
is no good being, being cross. What is the good of being cross? You see, it only makes matters worse. The Boer officer in charge had long been hunted by the British. Gideon Skippers was apprehended by the Coldstream Guards for shooting some local coloured people in the area who he reckoned had been spying for the British, which may be quite true or not, I don't know. Amongst these coloured people were a young, uh, a young girl who was pregnant and she was tied to the, uh, we, uh, the wheel of a wagon and thrashed until she gave birth under the lash. He was court-martialed in the courthouse here and then he was subsequently taken up to Croft Net, where he was executed by a firing squad. My father was actually present when he was executed. Marjorie Stuckey's grandmother had testified against Gideon Skippers at his trial. A century on, local loyalties are still divided. Well, I prefer not to say anything about him because I have to live in this town and the leader of this uh, lot who burnt the house is a hero in this town. Part of the Boers' heroic image comes from their tenacity in the face of great hardship. Hungry and with clothes in tatters, they were chased into the mountains of the Cape. Survival depended on hit-and-run attacks on isolated British units. General Smuts's commando was on its last legs when it stumbled on 200 men of the 17th Lancers, a crack British regiment nicknamed the Death or Glory Boys. Hugely outnumbered, a small group of exhausted Boers saw their chance. They came after the Lancers mainly because they needed provisions and horses. And Denais and, and the guys haven't got too much ammunition either. Yeah. So they've got to be pretty careful at who they're shooting at. Guide Steve Lunderstead shows Michael rates around the battlefield. Michael's grandfather, Denais Rates, was in the thick of the Boer attack on the Lancers. They've been here three or four days, I think, the 17th Lancers, okay. brought in as one of the stop groups yes. to try and catch Smuts's commander. And it certainly looks to me like a bit of a holiday camp. No pickets, no sentries out, yeah. in a valley, lovely house where the officers could sleep, mm. relax, yes. nice river nearby, yeah. reading the daily newspaper perhaps. But uh, certainly caught totally unawares. Yeah. The first the camp would have known of it is when this little bit of shooting started, okay. just here. The Boers had approached the camp down this road. They stormed the startled Lancers on rough ground just above the farm. The action only lasted minutes. Michael has brought with him his grandfather's diary of the war. He and Steve tie in the account of the attack on the Lancers a century ago to the actual location today. We shot the one Englishman after the other through the head as they peered over the rocks to fire. They're now peering over the rocks to fire? Yeah. He goes on to say a certain Lieutenant Sheridan stuck his head out right in front of Jan Boreas who instantly put a bullet through it. His hat jumped as much as a couple of feet into the air and we all shouted out with great jubilation in English, funnily enough. Good shot, Uncle Jack. This is a nightmare come true, you know that? Yeah. For the British. They, they won't at this stage believe this has happened to them. Yeah. It's total turmoil. Yeah. Right. And you've got this little group of Boers, because they were a little group of Boers, that have captured this entire rocky outcrop, which is the key to the battle. Mm. Anyone who controls this is controlling everything. Yeah. They all put up their hands and called we surrender, for God's sake, stop it, we surrender. We took their rifles and hurled these aside. Then, without attending to the prisoners, we burst into the camp. And this is your main memorial for the Death or Glory Boys. You've got your 
gunners who were killed on the ridge just behind us, where that gun yes. took on. In fact, a nace killed all four of them, I think. I remember correctly. Yeah. But this is mostly your, your men who died okay. in the action. The officers all have their own separate memorials. We've got old Lieutenant Russell, mm -hmm. all Lancers, Lieutenant Robert Morritt, mm -hmm. and old Lieutenant Richard Sheridan. Winston Churchill's yes. cousin. Yeah. Lieutenant 17th Lancers, Death or Glory Boys, one of 38 Brits to die, and only one Boer. Absolute disaster for the British Army. And completely the opposite for the Boers. It was salvation for them. They arrived here on their last legs, and the death of these people meant that they could re-equip themselves and fight on. And in fact, my grandfather rode away from here on Sheridan's horse. But the Boers were not content just to survive. Some tried to impose Boer control in the Northern Cape, across the arid wastes of the Great Karoo. Here, British colonial rule was stretched thin. The Boers hated the fact that the coloured people in settlements like Calvinia sided with the British against them. The English were nearer to the coloured people. They will come into your home and they will talk to you, they will eat from your plate. And uh, whereas the Boer will never ever have done that. And also the English people, uh, they will let you come in by their front door. And at the Bura, you have to go and knock at the kitchen door. You may not come in at the front door. Rachel Smith's great uncle, Abraham Esau, led coloured resistance against the Boers, living on in folk memory as a hero. He spied on the Boers. He petitioned Lord Milner, unsuccessfully, for guns. He organised the women and children to defend the town. In January 1901, Boers captured Calvinia and declared martial law. The Buddha saw Abraham Esau as a traitor, a rebel. He, they looked at him, he's making trouble, and uh, he, they, he's trying to, uh, to, to encourage the rest of the colored community to rise against the Buddha. Abraham Esau, a martyr remembered. During the anglo Boer War, tens of thousands of African and colored people aligned themselves with the British cause. Prominent amongst them was the village blacksmith, Abraham Esau. Esau and his compatriots had joined the fight to protect what few rights they had under imperial rule. In January of 1901, Calfinio was captured by free state commandos. Esau was amongst those who were arrested. The Buddha caught up with Abram Esau and they brought him to the town where he was killed. They was, he was dragged between two horses that my mother told me. And then he was shot. They told us, the children sometimes when we went there, that uh, they cut out his tongue and they cut out Abram's Esau's eyes, they took the eyes out. The next day, some of the people went to put flowers. Where his blood was spilled, they put some flowers there.
the coming of the English and the Boer War was a great tragedy that affected not only the Boers, but even the black people. They both suffered materially, spiritually, and otherwise. And the scars of that suffering are still there on both sides. By 1902, after two years of fighting, a quarter of a million British troops were finally gaining the upper hand over 20,000 Boers. The dying months of the war were the cruelest. Capture, death and desertion had whittled down Boer numbers. But the whole empire had answered Britain's call. Australia sent over 16,000, and they were all volunteers. New Zealand sent 6,500 men, the same number of horses, which were some of the best horses in the country, and a fair number of field pieces. Canada had nearly 8,000 volunteers here. So you got these huge numbers of colonial volunteers fighting on the British side and distinguishing themselves very much so. Sometimes I think very much to the discomfort of the British generals. Difficult people, those Australians. This was less a war of pitched battles than of isolated guerrilla skirmishes. One task was to clear the veldt of civilians, to cut off support for the Boers. Walker Thompson of the Bushmen's Corps wrote to his brother about the scorched earth policy. We burned hundreds of homes and had to turn the women and children out. It's a job I can't stand. We came over to fight men not women and children. Colonial troops were often used at the hard margins of the war, on the toughest terrain against die-hard Boer commandos. They earned a reputation for ruthlessness. The Bushveld Carboneers was an irregular outfit of Australians, loyal South Africans, British and others, raised to mop up in the wilds of the northern Transvaal. Several carboneers were court-martialed for shooting dead eight Boers after they had surrendered. Their defence was they had orders to take no prisoners. Two Australian officers, Lieutenants Breaker Morant and Hancock, were shot by firing squad for a practice that some got away with, as Walker Thompson witnessed. The Munster Fusiliers thought it would be easier to mine corpses than live men, so they bayoneted about 30 of the Boers, and lay down and had a good sleep. The Boers, too, increasingly committed atrocities against blacks fighting for the British. Boer General Marni Moritz and his men operated behind the lines in the British Cape Colony. In January 1902, they reached the settlement of Lelyfontein. The story has passed down the generations. This was a rich area. It had food, it had grain, it had sheep, it had cattle, and it had horses. My child, the Boers came, and they destroyed everything. They bankrupted everyone, and they planted poverty in our soil. The people of Lelyfontein were fiercely loyal to Britain. 
They served as scouts and spies, but Marnie Moritz wasn't having any of it. It my pa na hulle toe gegaan en vir hulle gesê, kyk, hierdie story wat julle die Engelse help, my father said to them, this business of you supporting the English, we don't want it. We won't bother you, but we don't want you coming out with all that shit here. We're giving you a proclamation which will tell you the terms under which you may live here. And he read it aloud to them. And when he got to the point where it said, I do not want to find you in this war fighting for the Queen of England, Barnabas Link said, you bastard, don't you speak that way about my queen? And he hit my father over the head with a knob carrier. It was with a knob carry like this that he hit Maritz, and that blow cost all the trouble right there and then. As Maritz came down in front of the church, Barney Langs hit him with a stick. And then vengeance came into the war. They used to say that General Maritz could use this as well as any cowboy used his gun. If you look at it, you can see that it had a range of a thousand meters. It was an unusual revolver in that you could add this on and then you'd shoot with it butted up against your shoulder. This is the weapon he fought with at Lillifontaine. That day they shot and killed eight colored people. The Boers then retreated through this pass, where they were ambushed by the people of Lelyfontein, who rolled boulders down onto them, killing 30 Boers. The next day, he went back with his men in an organized commando to take his revenge, because they could have killed him. Moritz and his men wiped out Lelyfontein, strewing bodies across the church garden. 46 killed and 100 wounded. The survivors shackled as slaves or scattered in terror. The women folk had to bury those who were shot. My child, it was a sad story our old people told us. Boers like Moritz were determined that nothing must threaten white supremacy in South Africa. But the people of Lelyfontein had no compunction about taking on the Boers. They, like many other non-whites in South Africa, were active players in this war. Across the country there was considerable variation in allegiance. Most Basutos sided with Britain, but some believed their best hopes lay with the Boers and weren't afraid to strike out on their own. The Basutu said the English were good people, not like the Boers. My grandfather disagreed. He said a Boer will do exactly what he says. When he says, I'll pay you, he really means it. When he says, I'll thrash you, he means that as well. He gives you a good beating. You know where you are with the Boers. People started hating my grandfather because he continued to like them. The Boers always needed fresh supplies. They increasingly relied on sympathetic blacks 
like Etienne Mufutsunyana's grandfather. He had a house not far from here. During the night, he flew a flag at his house so the boars wouldn't get lost. He would hide them in his house while he went to Basutuland to buy clothes for them. Then they would leave and others would come and he would do the same all over again. The Boers did not find all blacks so helpful. Those who tried to stop the Boers commandeering their food paid a heavy price, as Dora Ramotibi remembers. The Boers were criminals. We were scared of them. We hid ourselves because of the Boers. Because if they found us in our homes, they would burn our homes down. People were burned to death in their homes. The British also torched black homes to deny support to the Boers. Will Saxon of the Manchester Regiment wrote home about these operations. As far as I could see in every direction, kraals were burning. I feel sorry for the black women. The tears rolled down their cheeks and the pickanins cluster round them. I always think of a wounded stag when I see them, staring at their burning huts. The British herded over 120,000 blacks into a network of 75 concentration camps. Little known about during the war, the black camps have been all but forgotten since. They initially seemed like sanctuary after the dangers of living on the felt. Anna Mollekeng has never forgotten her first sight of the Scottish soldiers. They weren't wearing ordinary clothes. They were wearing red skirts. They had fringed belts across their chests. You'd see them sashaying along. Their berets on their heads and their clothes made them look nothing like boers. This is how they walked. But conditions in the camps were appalling. Disease was rife. All save the poorest blacks had to pay for their food. The only way to earn money was to work for the British, a form of forced labor. If you didn't have a man in your family working for the army, you were charged double for rations. <laughs> This was a hard war. Our grannies used to gather locusts for us to eat. Not the big kind you have today, but little ones. They dug up worms for us to chew. We used to eat those worms and also roots from the ground just to survive. The war was heavy going. It was so tough. All we could do was live from day to day. If the inmates wanted shelter from South Africa's extreme climate, the British weren't about to provide it. The superintendent of Brantford Camp was given strict orders. Tents allotted to you are only for white camps. On no account must these be given to natives. The blacks lived as third-class citizens, and that's how they died. 
It was bad in those days. We didn't all get out of the camp alive. A lot of people died. The old women couldn't take it. They were dropping like flies, dead. The Reverend W.H.R. Brown was one of very few to visit a black camp. They have lost everything. And there being no political party interested in their destiny, they go to the wall, as the weakest are bound to. The Boers still fighting for independence called themselves bitter enders. But the tougher the struggle became, and the likelier British victory looked, the more Boers changed sides. By the final months, a quarter of all Boers in the field were joiners, fighting for the British. My father was not nearly as opposed to the English as he was to the joiners. He simply could not stand them. He felt that what they had done was just unforgivable, to betray your nation and your country and your people. A unit of the 600-strong farmers' guard at Bloemfontein. They sided with the British to protect their farms against their fellow Boers. Hence their motto, what we have we hold, inscribed in bullets over the British crown. Joiners helped the British track down Boers and burn their farms. There were reports of Boers castrating joiners they managed to capture. There were joiners in the camps, put there for their own protection, often in positions of petty authority. The joiners at Bias left them right, uh, the joiners treated the people in the camps much worse than the English did. They thought they were the bee's knees. They mocked them. Your husbands are fighting, you're dying of hunger, and we've got piles of food. Many of the camps were run by renegade Boers. And you get the small, miserable interaction between people who are too close together and have no love. And I think this is what happens, and this is why in South Africa, in that war, one had the elements of a civil war. More root, more root. The Boers' troubles were mounting. They had relied on the British to house their families in the white concentration camps, awful as they were. By 1902, following the visit and report of the Fawcett Commission, death rates fell and conditions improved, as Boer General Louis Botha confirmed. One is only too thankful nowadays to know that our wives are under English protection. But Lord Kitchener decided to leave the Boer women and children on the veldt. Let their menfolk look after them. But the veldt was now a very dangerous place. White women, black women, all were vulnerable. Maruti Setiloane recalls a story told him by an eyewitness. There came this troop of English soldiers on horseback. And there was this woman there who was gathering cow dung, dry cow dung, to go and make fire. And as they came on, there she was, obviously, naturally, like soldiers, like men who had been away from home, they were sex-starved. They came and they pushed her off and they raped her. And he tells about how she lay there and one would go into her and go over and another one would come into her and go over, and every time when somebody, as she lay with her arms open like that, they would take a note with the queen's head and put it on her hand. That is the fairness of the British. You've got to pay for what you get. My father and others 
they would uh, assault these, uh, sexually assault these uh, poor girls. And you see, the point was this. It's not easy to always find a white woman around anywhere. Where I grew up on the farm, a woman was sacrosanct, a white one was sacrosanct. Here was a, an open sesame situation where you can take these girls and they can't uh, refuse, they can't defend themselves. And very often things like that did in fact take place. European propaganda blamed the British for giving blacks power over white women. The Boers had their own response. My master's thief brood. My mother's stepbrother planted them in holes. When they caught a Hottentot molesting women on the farms, they would plant him like a pole in the ground, alive. They planted them so deep that they couldn't get out. Some Boers now fear that the blacks were threatening the established racial order in South Africa. A lookout point known as Grenadier Hill in the Northern Cape. The soldiers whiled away the time by carving their names. Next to the Tommies are the names of their three black comrades in arms, Ali, Sixpence and John. The Boer War had given the blacks an enhanced status alongside Englishmen and a taste of power over the Boers. My father had a uniform and a gun and uh, he had the protection of the English, and uh, wherever the English were, and they were, and they, my father was there, and when the attack against the boys, he saw the boys run away, you know, saw the boys run away. The boys were frightened of the soldiers, the car keys. It was a bit of sensational pleasure to see them run away. It seemed to the Cape politician, John X. Merriman, that the genie was out of the bottle. These people will have been armed and set on to fight and harry white men. It will be difficult to get the arms from them and to teach them to unlearn the lesson. The Boers' knee-jerk reaction was to slaughter blacks they caught fighting against them. A British soldier summed it up. Johnny Boer used to shoot niggers like you'd shoot a dog. By April 1902, General Botha and General De Vett had warned the burghers still on the battlefield not to execute blacks summarily. It is clear that Botha and De Vett were worried because the consequences could be very bad for future relations. The Boers, in thinking about the post-war order, clearly saw the end approaching. They could hardly move for the maze of British blockhouses and barbed wire. They could scarcely find food in a land devastated by the British. The Boers were outgunned and outnumbered. My mother saw these overwhelming hordes of English soldiers. She often told us that when they marched towards the Boers, it looked as if the earth was trembling. And when an English soldier fell dead in battle, the others simply climbed over him and kept on coming and coming. It was really a hopeless task for the Boers to carry on fighting, for the Boers even to think of winning war. The 11th of April, 1902, Boer Commandant Potgitter lay dead on the felt after the last formal battle of the Boer War. Hostilities seemed to fizzle out and the Boers agreed to peace talks. The Boer delegates met on the 15th of May, south of Pretoria, at Vereniging. The more they talked, the clearer the calamity became. 
Men spoke of a dire lack of food and horses, of the treachery of joiners, and of their family's plight on the felt. They'd always believed God would never let them be defeated. The will of God was for the burghers very important. The will of God was very important to the burghers. And when the talks were held at Vereniging, some people said, what if God is not on our side? Or what if God wants us to lay down our weapons and submit to the inevitable, to the fact that we have lost our independence? What if God is not with us? Peace negotiations with the British took place in this pavilion the Boers were offered guarantees of personal freedom and property rights. The right to use their language in school and courtroom. A three million pound compensation fund for farmers. And the promise of future political autonomy. But would there be any extension of rights to the blacks, as suggested a year before by Colonial Secretary Joseph Chamberlain? We cannot consent to purchase a shameful peace by leaving the coloured population in the position in which they stood before the war. But now the priority was to reconcile British and Boer interests. Earlier advice of Lord Milner pointed the way forward. You only have to sacrifice the nigger absolutely, and the game is easy. Britain ensured white dominance and black subjugation by leaving it to the Boers to decide whether to give voting rights to the blacks, thus condemning them to nearly a century of exclusion and oppression. When the peace treaty was being negotiated at Franklin, my people were not there. The black people were not there. Not only were the blacks not there, but even the interests of black, blacks were not taken in, and we were easy to be got rid of. Some black peoples, like the Bahatla in the Western Transvaal, had seen the war as a chance to regain land the Boers took from them long before, to settle old scores. The Bahatla had fought valiantly on the British side. They believed that, come victory, their loyalty would be rewarded. We hoped the talks would lead to us getting our land back, but we were not allowed to take part in the discussions. They didn't keep us in the picture. We were just ignored. We had fought in the war to recover our land. If we didn't get that, what was the point of us fighting? But then the whites buried the hatchet and closed ranks against us. They became like brothers dividing our land between themselves, and we were left with nothing. On the 31st of May 1902, the Boers signed the surrender terms ensuring their eventual supremacy in South Africa. But at the time, they felt their world had caved in. My father was in torment. They say that that morning he got onto his horse and rode around like a man possessed. The thought of peace terrified him, and he did not know how to deal with it. And when General Smuts returned to his men and said it was peace, there was great animosity. Because the people did not want peace. They said the only thing that should come between a man and his freedom is death. Marnie Moritz's men were actually photographed surrendering. But Moritz was far away. He and others had chosen exile rather than life under British rule. The Boers now had to go through the humiliating formalities, signing the oath of allegiance to the Crown, giving up their weapons. My pa was very unhappy because they my father was very unhappy at having to hand over his guns at Vereniging. It was very difficult for him to bid farewell to his gun because it had been his friend for three long years. Three difficult, bitterly difficult years. There was one gun Daddy did not give up, his Mauser rifle. That one he kept. He just handed in his Lee Metford. 
met die vrede sluit. My father was maar ongelukkig in hulle hart, want ek meen hulle... My father was heartbroken that the Boers had lost. They lost their country, they lost everything. Many lost their wives and children, so they were bitter and very unhappy. But under the circumstances, they could not carry on anymore. De Vet and other Boer leaders went around the white camps, explaining the peace deal to the inmates. Some women had wanted the war to continue, saying, I can get a new husband, but I can't get a new Transvaal. But others asked, what is the independence of my country to me when my man is dead? And then, the leaving of the camps, as Christina Ninaba remembers. The day came and they told us, the war is over. Get your things together, we'll drop you in Johannesburg. Everyone got on the wagons. Some women were weeping, some laughing and some singing. Singing for the dead children they were leaving behind. The British had incarcerated Boer prisoners of war on the island of St Helena and in Ceylon and Bermuda. Now these men came home and went in search of their families. Some men arrived at the camps only to find no one in their family alive. No child, no wife, nobody. The man would stand there with his hat on his head and his horse at his arm, and he'd ask, where are they? And the reply would come, they're over there in the cemetery. Recognizing your own father could be a problem. My father came home. I was small and silly. My father sat there. And my mother said, say hello to your father. I said, that's not my father. My father doesn't have hair around his face. That's a baboon. The group of women on the station embraced their husbands and cried, and it was a terrible scene. But my grandmother was a tiger of a woman, and she said to my grandfather, Gideon, don't just stand there blubbing. There's work to be done on the farm. There was nothing. Nothing on the farms. The corn was burnt. The grain fields were burnt. Wheat had been emptied from sacks and trampled by horses. The joiners profited little from collaboration. Many returned to ruined farms and the undying hatred of their Boer neighbors. Everything they owned was destroyed. If you set fire to my fields, the wind will blow the flames across to theirs. They thought they'd get cakes and ale, but they only got thorns. The British Tommy had secured South Africa and her mineral wealth for the empire. Now he too was going home. A demob parade in Preston. 
a scene repeated across Britain. Mary Liverseed remembers that day. When the soldiers came home, we went to see them return. They were in this dull khaki, and they marched round the town hall, and then they stood, and the bonfire was lit, and they watched the bonfire. And looking back, I can picture them now, and I think they looked embarrassed more than happy to be home quite embarrassed standing with this bonfire as their reward for coming back. The war had different endings for each of the participants. Britain and her colonies left over 22,000 behind in South Africa, buried in cemeteries and on the felt. Over a hundred thousand dead and wounded. As Rudyard Kipling wrote, we have had no end of a lesson. It will do us no end of good. The Boer War established a pattern of empire solidarity, which would include South Africa, repeated in conflicts down the century. It gave more than a taste of wars to come, against freedom-fighting guerrillas and against civilians, colonial strife and total war. Battles like Spion Cop were curtain raisers for the slaughter on the Somme. In time, the Boer War receded from Britain's memory eclipsed by two world wars. It had ushered in the modern age, but no longer seemed part of it. The Imperial Light Horse Memorial bears a fitting epitaph. Tell England, ye who pass this monument, we who died serving her, rest here content. But the blacks were not content. Most had to give their guns back to the British and land back to the Boers. They faced poverty and famine. By the end of the war, there were more blacks fighting than Boers, but they got almost no compensation and even less recognition. They had defended Mafeking with their lives, but Baden-Powell fibbed to the Royal Commission on the war, saying they had run away at the first shots. A memorial was put up to Mafeking's gallant white defenders. The blacks were a grudging afterthought. The tens of thousands of blacks who supported the Boers and fought alongside them fared even worse. What gets one really worked up? today is when the Africana wants to make as if he is the only one who lost in the Boer War and forgets that the black man shared as much of his riches, of his livelihood, and even of his blood. I say I lost my two uncles in the Boer War. There is this bitterness against the Boer for not having remembered them. And that is the reason why, when the, 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 the whole question of the celebration of the Boer War in South Africa came, we said, rubbish, how can you come and celebrate in an African country, in a country that has become free, the ignominy that has been suffered by the black men at the hands of the Africana, who at the Boer War used us Ei diep des Hans verlore. But the Boers had their own agenda, to set themselves apart from and above all other peoples in South Africa. 
the white concentration camps would play a key role in that process. Orange River Station Camp is one of the very few untouched since the inmates left a century ago. Twenty-six thousand Boer women and children, ten percent of their population, perished in the camps from disease and neglect. The experience scarred the survivors and their families for life. There was so much sadness in those songs. It has stayed with me my whole life. I cannot forget it. At the second verse, my grandma would start singing with her tiny, squeaky little voice. It was like a bat floating above my grandpa's baritone. And at the third line, the dog would start howling along with them. That became a tradition in our home. I asked my father, why are grandpa and grandma so sad? My father told me it was because of the concentration camps. Grandpa and grandma never, ever got over it. Their twin girls who died and the other little children, Grandpa never recovered. But private grief and bitter personal memories like these were exploited to underpin white supremacy. The first moves had come in 1913, when the Boers, by now self-governing, met at Bloemfontein to honour those who died in the white concentration camps. The suffering and deaths of the women and children in the concentration camps was an important cornerstone in the establishment of Afrikaner nationalism in the 20th century. The white concentration camps were elevated to the only concentration camps in existence to represent the suffering and to unite the Afrikaner people. The argument went we are a people purified by adversity. We alone have suffered like this. We alone are fit to rule in South Africa. History that didn't fit was obliterated. Even the black maids who accompanied their Boer mistresses into the white camps were quickly forgotten. The camps were built over with sombre memorials to the white dead. The black servants who died there were buried some distance away in unmarked graves. As for the black concentration camps, over the years their very existence was expunged from South Africa's history. The the white concentration camps became everything, and yet the suffering in the black concentration camps was as bad. A very neglected aspect of the war is that we did not utilize the common ground that we had with the blacks in this country. I'm speaking now from an Afrikaner's point of view that we did not make more of the black concentration camps, not to make political gains, but rather to emphasize the common suffering, which is the most important potential unifying factor between us and the blacks. A century of silence and cover-up has made the black camps very hard to find today. An old map shows one in the Free State, near Alleman's Siding,
There is no record of the camp's exact location, but there are graves on a nearby hillside. Not one or two, but many. Hermanus Pitsu, the black farm worker who found the graves, shows them to local historian Johan Lok. They are watched by the owner of the land, Andre Hayes. Her family wasn't here during the Boer War, and she had no idea there were graves on her farm. Some of these graves contain more than one body. Current estimates put black deaths in the camps at 18,000. But new discoveries are pushing the figures upwards. It's possible that as many people died in the black concentration camps as in the white. Ik ken nou Hermanus, het nou hier rondgeloop bij die begraafplaats, ja. om te kijken wat ons krijgt. En ons het ook die graften geteld. Ja. Hoeveel is dat? 638 graften. Ja, nu kan het niet geloven, dat is ja, ongelooflijk. Bij graften. Ons denkt dat het is die graften van een Britse concentratiekamp voor zwart mensen. Mijn pa zelf het niet geweet dat hij uh, die kamp was. Nee. Hoe het jij geweet is graften die van die. Van die Hermanus zei van mij dat het begraafplaats zo bijna bij een kamp geweest is. Oh. Dit is een taak voor de toekomst, maar we gaan hem krijgen. Ja, ik wonder. Ik weet waar je Ja, ja. daar is zo'n toef. Ja. Waar die landen is. Nee, dat is maar ja. gaan hem krijgen, Hermanus. Ja. Maar zei, zoek voor die kamp. En ook zijn mannen zoek voor die kamp. En zoek voor as op en zoek voor die kamp. Ja, dan kan je wat kan die bij die zoekplaats worden. Ja, dat kan je dat plek krijgen. The Boer War has cast a long shadow across the century. Only since black majority rule can its lost history, shared by blacks and whites, be recovered. <laughs> 